Good morning and welcome to this, the 30th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Um, I've received apologies this morning from Mary Fee, who is unwell and won't be able to join us. And I'm sure she will be incredibly disappointed about that because this is an issue that she's pursued uh, long and hard. Um, but hopefully we'll do her justice this morning. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones uh, are switched on to silent and for members to have their phones off the desk, please? Um, our first agenda item this morning is an agreement by committee to take agenda item three in private, our committee agreed to do that? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, and our second agenda item today is our substantive agenda item, which is our, our main business um, and the committee's work towards Human Rights Day, which is Sunday. So we have dedicated this committee session to uh, Human Rights Day, and we're looking at underrepresented and marginalised groups. And with us this morning, we have um, a group, of a group of children. Last year, we had a group of children with us um, who came along and gave evidence to committee, and they were uh, from primary four upwards, and they were superb. And some of the uh, actions that we took forward from, from then have, have really related and changed to, to policy at Scottish Government level. So we're hoping that the focus we put on this issue to do will do the same. And I know for many of you, that's been a long, hard uh, fought for um, um, uh, advance, but we hope to. Uh, keep pushing that along. So with us this morning, uh, we have members from the Gypsy Traveller community and in Davies uh, Donaldson's um, uh, explanation this morning, you're all travellers, so uh, if you're okay, we'll refer to you as, as travellers. Is that, is that fine? Yeah. So with us this morning, we have um, uh, Charlotte Donaldson, um, John McDonald, Shannon McDonald, Charlotte McKenzie and Anthony Johnson. And with us we have uh, Kerry Musselbrook and Seamus McPhee and Rosanna McPhee um, from the Bob and Mill uh, Project in Pitlochry. And Kerry is from the IRIS Project. Um, Kerry, thank you for the booklet uh, that IRIS has produced along with uh, Seamus and Rosanna. It's a, um, a very uh, good uh, reminder of, of the history. Um, and we're very keen to hear a bit about the history. But actually we're much more keen about the future. Uh, to hear your comments on where we should be going from now. We've got the timeline and the papers of all of the work that this place has done since its inception in 1999 to try and push forward um, some of the challenges and the discrimination that the traveller community face. Um, uh, so we're looking really forward to hearing what, what you've got to say this morning. And that's the reason why we have you guys here, the young people, because it's you know one thing for politicians to ask, well, what should we do next? That next should be about learning from the past, and that's why we have uh, some of the other people here. But it should be, how do we take that learning from the past and use it to, to change the future? I was going to open generally, Davey, we're asking you to give us a wee bit of an insight. You gave us an informal briefing earlier. We don't need to uh, do all of that, but if you can give us a wee bit of a, a briefing on where you think we're at now um, and we can then talk about how we move that forward to change uh, uh, and uh, end that type of discrimination that you're facing. Davy. So just now, um, very little's changed to be honest. Um, I mean certainly from everyone sitting around the table, um, I'm sure you can respect that, but from our perspective, speaking to my grandfather, nothing's changed. You know, if anything, things have got worse in certain areas. You know, people are, seem to be more um, inhospitable to folk camping. They seem to be more um, aggressive towards folk shifting and the nomadic behaviour than what my granddad received when he was younger. But certainly in regards to the schooling, um, education, local authority, um, awareness of the culture as well as respect of the culture and society's respect and awareness, nothing's changed. It's remained stagnant completely. Um, where we're at just now, I mean, I did say it kind of informally in the last meeting, but we're at a point where you've got young travellers going to school and the only reason they can access school is because they're hiding their ethnicity. We're at a point where I'm the only Scottish traveller that I know right now currently at university. We're at a point where young travellers are having to really struggle to gain employment because of their ethnicity and they're being barred from certain types of employment, and there's many barriers um, to employment for travellers. We're at a point where the culture is being completely constricted to a degree where a lot of young travellers don't see it existing in the next 50 years. We're at a critical point. That's basically what I'm saying. Um, for the Scottish traveller community, we're at a completely critical point, and we really, really need um, affirmative, strong action from government from the top down um, to actually impact in 
on local authorities and actually say, look, this needs to be done. Not I'm recommending this to be done, because at the end of the day, the local authority will never follow up those. We've, we've seen that. That's been done for years, as you've been saying. We need affirmative action where young travellers can challenge hate crime, they can challenge racism, and they can actually access the same opportunities that the settled community takes so for granted. So that's where we are just now. Um, I'm sure we'll, some of the other travellers around the table as well will want to add a lot to that, um, but that's the summary of where we're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any other, any of the other young people that want to say something now, or will we go into some questions and come back to you? Yeah, Rosanna, do you want to yeah, come in at this point? Like yeah, I would like to say something. Yeah, Can of course. I, that? Um, I mean, this is gypsy traveller history in Scotland, so it's, I see myself as a gypsy more than a traveller, and I actually found reports in the archives in Blair Castle going way back when Duchess um, Catherine Ramsay, the seventh Duchess, actually interviewed my great-grandmother, and she said to her, why you call me a traveller? I'm a gypsy. And I think the linguistics actually point to that. My brother's got a postgraduate from Warwick in linguistics with a merit of distinction. And he um, gave evidence to the 2008, 2008 case of K. McLennan versus G. T., which established, so did I, established ethnicity. So I think to keep saying we're all travellers or travellers, that, that's a matter for self-determination, really. <laughs> I'd just like to say that. Plus, it's, things have changed because they've got worse. I, that was me berry picking in 2005, but by 2007 I was turned away because they didn't need me. Why did the farmers not need me? Oh, we don't need you because we're taking people in from Eastern Europe. Well, that's fair enough, but I came first and I was there since I was a child picking berries. So... Um, you know, this nonsense about post-Brexit, there's lots of people sitting unemployed who'd be quite happy to pick berries for £400 a week. And when I picked berries, you didn't get that. You got 10 or 15 pence a basket. You also got thrown in a barn. You weren't getting the uh, caravan set up with the electric cookers checked and all the rest of it, which is what's happening now. So I'd point to the fact, um, to what Anthony's saying there, in the previous session, that it's not a case of it's cheaper to take in Eastern migrant workers. Um, it's a case of, a, I think it's my perception that it's complete racism to um, totally blanket ban gypsy travellers from the farms and take in workers from abroad. But hopefully Brexit will sort that one out. I think we'll, we'll maybe uh, not focus too much on Brexit in this committee today, if you don't, if you don't mind, because it's a huge other other issue. Um, obviously, it is. Um, the, and, and I apologise for the, the use of language, because one of the issues that we all have is ensuring that we use the right language, and it's something that we're incredibly mindful of uh, at the committee. Um, so, yeah, Seamus. And I said there um, that you know there's actually been a reclamation of the term gypsy in certain quarters, um, just as there has been in Spain with gitanos. They don't want to be seen as Roma. Um, and you know, both myself and Rosanna and other members of the Scottish Gypsy Traveller Association campaigned for inclusion of the term gypsy in the official designation, which was adopted by the Parliament. Okay. Uh, uh, Davy's already told me that his grandfather's a manouche, so, you know, if we're all travellers, then, you know, how does that come to be? Of course. Um, no, I think it's important. I think it is completely what Rosanna's saying. It's self-determination. Um, it's one of these things that you'll never get right, because um, there'll always be a member of the community or an aspect of the community wants to be referred to as something else. Um, but certainly from my perception um, on the ground, th most people wouldn't take offence at being called a traveller. Um, so whereas people, you would get Scottish travellers who take great offence at being called a gypsy. So to me, it's more of a, I use it quite often because it's a, a more, uh, it's an easier term to not cause offence. Well, can I just say, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't take offence at being called a gypsy, but I would take offence at being called a traveller because it's, identified with nomadism and not ethnicity. Okay. So being a gypsy means, you know, there are other characteristics that uh, determine who you are. Yeah. Linguistic, common ancestry, you know, um, common shared beliefs uh, and, and, you know, cultural values. Now, if you're saying you're just a traveller, that could be 
Julia Roberts going to a film premiere in Paris. It's a generic term. Just as tinker is a restrictive occupational term, now Rosanna there's a head ex head of department, <laughs> you know, in Plotton High School, and uh, I'm a translator, so I don't make tin. And yeah. to me, that's you know wholly inaccurate to yeah. use that as a pejorative term. We're grateful for the, the, the distinction, and you're absolutely right when it comes to ethnicity. The distinction is, is, is what we need in law to ensure that we can push, push some of this forward. But if we can get any some of the substantive issues about how uh, everyday life is, is affected, and uh, we've got some questions from uh, committee members here. But the way I want to, to work this is try to be as informal as possible. So if you do have a point to make, then give me a wee nod or a wee, you know, something to let me know that you want in to, to have your your say because I'm really, really keen to hear from maybe some of the quieter members of the, the, the group that have maybe got more to say, actually. So we're, we're keen to hear from you guys, but why don't I go to a question from Alex Cole Hamilton first and sort of a warm it up a wee bit and then we can go from there. Is that agreeable? Yeah, Alex. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the committee today. I think the discussion we've just had about nomenclature and terms and identity just gives a flavour of just how diverse and rich the, these cultures are that we're talking about here. It's very easy to group them, group everybody together, and with that, the overarching prejudice that I think we, we've heard some of today. Um, I think, Anthony, um, when you spoke to us in the informal session at the start, you referred to the last form of acceptable racism in this country, and I think you, you articulated very well what that looks like. One of the things I was struck by was the reference to broadcasting. Now, we saw some of the um, references to online comments and uh, things that people who aren't in broadcasting say when articles are posted up. But I'm very keen to hear what your view is in terms of the portrayal by the mainstream media of your cultures, um, because obviously um, the, the media shapes our national culture and the way in which we view you. Um, so can you give us some examples of how uh, you feel the broadcasting uh, lets you down in that way? Anthony, do you want to... Uh, yeah. Um, well, us being travellers, obviously, we're uh, not secretive people, but obviously because we live our own and we do our own thing, obviously, you know what I mean? Um, it's not that... I'm not trying to say that We've been totally hurt up against, and we're not, you know, like that. We're not trying to look for something off the everyday person that goes to work every single day. We're not looking for nothing extra off anybody. But we're human beings, and we're the same as yourself. Do you know what I mean? No, we're looking to get on. That's it. But as you say, it's about the the last acceptable racism and that that does exist, obviously, and it's harder getting on with that. But for us to try and, you know get on with something, because we've been portrayed by the media like we're looking for something else. As we're going to argue with the government, apparently, that, you know, about sites and about this and that there. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, if you were at home and somebody turned around, like a bailiff <laughs> comes round to your house and turns around and says to you, obviously, you know, you own this house, and obviously, they turn around and say, move. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a shock, more than anything. We get up with this thing that we're, we're going to sit and argue with us all day long, all day long. All we're trying to do is move on. Do you know what I mean? And, and the mainstream media puts us like this big... Uh, I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to call it. Like we're a, a situation. We're a statistic. We're a number. More than anything. We're not human beings. Do you know what I mean? That's the thing. And, and I'd like people to start looking at... Instead of being, you know just a number, is looking into the actual life that, that we lead. Instead of just going, they're gypsy travellers, they've got dogs, they've got horses, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh, they have wagons and they move up and down the country. There's a lot more to it. We have, we have families and we want education. We want, you know, just to move on as normal people. The same as any ethnic group wants to stop calling different and start just moving on. As, as civilised, do you know what I mean? That's that's the thing. Is we just want to be part of it. Do you know what I mean? Instead of being pushed aside, like they're different. Do you know? And it, it's if I, me standing next to you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's the thing. As soon as I open my mouth, do you know, that's that's the thing. You know what I mean? And it, it, it's stupid, but it's, it's there. It's a real thing, and it, it's not 
like it's just there. It's it's been there for a long time. You know, uh, me and Dave and Charlotte, his cousins, oh, our grandfather went through went through you know the same as what we're going through today, but just in a different version. You know, and and we've got family there that's been serving the country and and going in the army and things and leading the same kind of life as as you know. Anybody else would hope to, and trying to, you know, stand up for their own country and, and, and move on and trying to get more integrated into it. And it doesn't happen as easy as you think, you know. There's always a, there's always a case, and I, I know, I, please don't think I'm just giving you a sob story and asking for something. I'm not, I'm just asking you to look at it from that point of view. Instead of, you know, oh, they've got wagons and they've got horses and they've got kids and dogs and they, and they like to make a mess. It's not just that case. It's we, we have people that stay in houses. There's lots of us that stay in houses. There's lots of us that give up our heritage, where we come from, just so we can be normal, if you know what I mean. That's, that's the thing. And, and we're giving up that because of that one wee nicky bit of racism, because it's easier for us to just, you know, to give up, just forget it. And then that's our culture is forgotten. And you see it happening a lot more through travellers and things. And I'm, I'm not asking anybody else for anything. I'm not saying that you guys are here to blame. I'm not saying that anything's going to make a difference. Because, you know, there's only a couple of members here. It doesn't account for the few million people in this country. Do you know what I mean? And it never will, in, in as much as, it, obviously, you know. But I'd like to start being changes like school systems and things, because obviously I went to primary school and things like that there, and, 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 and from my teachers, I got treated like an animal. <laughs> honestly, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. Honestly, they hated to see me coming. And I'm not saying I was bad, because I, I was there every day, but just they hated to see me coming because of my last name or because of where I come from. They knew, uh, or because I have to sign a, a sheet of paper that tells them that I'm a Scottish traveller. As soon as they've got that mark against my name, blacklisted my whole life, that's it. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's something as stupid as that that's holding us back. That is it. Do you know what I mean? Thanks, Anthony. I think Kerry, Kerry wanted to come in. Um, she's got some comments to make on this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about our motivation for creating this pictorial history, because I suppose it was really around um, challenging some of the myths that feed into our media and our culture. Um, about sharing that proud history and heritage and making that more widely known um, and acknowledging the past because while we all want to move forward I think there is an issue there about acknowledging past wrongs and appreciating sort of um, the suspicion and mistrust between gypsy travellers and a lot of public services because they have been treated badly and it's all there um, and my, my, my personal take is that something like this should be used in schools to um, start young, start early, um, so that gypsy traveller history is better known, understood and celebrated. Um, and for me, the next logical step is for you to have your own cultural centre or something like that to be present because they're so marginalised, they're not visible, they're not seen. Um, and if they're not seen, they're, it's too easy to be misunderstood. Alex. Thank you, Convener. The, the casual racism that we've heard a lot about this morning, I mean, has these even permeated into this building here. And I remember we were, many of us were shocked when Douglas Ross, as MSP, a Conservative MSP, referred to Gypsy Traveller communities as a blight. Had he used that term against any black or minor, minority ethnic community, there would have been uproar. Um, do you think that we need to do more through legislation to protect your... Um, your status in a, as, a, as a protected characteristic um, and to challenge that kind of casual racism, even when it stalks the corridors of power in this place? Yes, I'd, I think that the findings of the case of Kay McLennan versus G T 2008, which established ethnicity beyond all doubt for me, um, that should have been built upon and built into the race, Scottish government race scheme. Um, I have letters from members of the Scottish Government saying we, treat, we will treat you as an ethnic minority. No, we are an ethnic minority. It's on the, on the statute book. It may not have been in an upper court, but there was a wealth of evidence put forward by ourselves and by academics, professors, who you know are well tutored in the subject. And um, this uh, continual denial coming out of the central government that we will treat you as a 
an ethnic minority, and we will do something to treat you as an ethnic minority. That should have that legislation should have been passed round and permeated all the different services, all the different policies at local level. Hasn't done so. I mean, it's not happened. For instance, one case that I advocated in was to do with planning, and it was Inverclyde Basin, and there wasn't a single uh, site in four different areas: Glasgow City, Inverclyde one of the Renfrew showers, I can't remember, and one of the Lanarkshires. And yet there was no, re no reference to gypsies or travellers in the plan and a uh, um, local development plan except we will continue to monitor this. What's to monitor? The local authorities were saying they don't have any and they were calling me from um, disused industrial sites saying, can you help? So th if that was in the local plans, you wouldn't be seeing so much of this, let's park my car park, let's set up, because there's nowhere to go. And another thing, if it was actually recognising in all the legislation, that unauthorised um, unauthorised encampment guidelines for gypsy traveller camps should be um, looked at seriously again, because under that, it's up to the local authority to make recommendations about what would be um, official stopping places and they're never going to do that because it's recommendations as we've heard but at the end of the day that piece of uh, pol that policy document is a waste of space it was well just taken out of the equation because no one's paying attention to it for good or bad okay thank you Davey. yeah i mean uh, quite a lot of what's been spoken about is really important i'd just like to share one example of political racism that i personally experienced um it wasn't as high up as government, but it was local authority level. And I was at a community planning exec meeting, and uh, this was years ago, and I was the vice chair of the local youth council, so I was invited along to these things. But no one sitting around the table, it was my first time there, nobody can't, I was a traveller. And uh, we were discussing NHS provision or something in rural communities, in marginalised communities. And they were talking about logistics that would come into that and the sorts of legislation and things that needed to be looked at. And... I was sitting there, and the whole way through the meeting, they spoke about rural communities, people who lived on coastal towns, which would be hard to access, all this sort of stuff. And they were talking about dementia care and things. And I thought that's really, really important to my community. So I, um, I put my hand at the end. I was shy, honest to God. I was sitting there, and it was heaps of folk in suits, and that here's me sitting, I think I was 16 or something like that. And uh, I said, what about the Gypsy Traveller community? I said, I know there's huge issues with trying to gain access to healthcare for the older gypsy travellers. I said, what about the gypsy travellers in Aberdeenshire? Is there anything we could put in place for, for them? And the whole table went silent. I was absolutely terrified. Silent, and the big guy at the top, to this day, I can't mind his name, and I wish I could so I could complain about what he said. But he was chairing the meeting, so he must have been important. Big suit in that. And he looks over and he says, who are you? And I said, I'm David Donaldson, the vice chair of the youth council. He said, like, okay, well, here's your first lesson then, David. He says, no one here cares about the tanks. And then they just carried on. And they completely overlooked my suggestion and it was never even spoken about ever again. I was shamed to death. I was completely insulted. I was so shocked that a man of such high standing, because up till then I was very naive. I thought local authorities were good and they, they all had good intentions. But it's just another example of what gets spoken about behind closed doors. And it happens so much. I hear so many times, I've got lots of contacts in the council through different work um, across local authorities. And uh, one specific example I recently heard about was an internal email that had been sent around. And um, the internal email actually was speaking about a, a potential site, a potential um, development that a traveller man was planning and I won't say who it was but there was a a guy in quite high position replied to all of his colleagues regarding the email that this man had sent requesting help doing app, like planning applications and things um, don't help him he's a traveller give the help to a good honest man and he did a blanket ban on all his colleagues so that's the sort of internal stuff we're getting at local authority level I mean, I'm still naive enough to hope that it's not existent at this sort of level. However, Douglas Ross really did dash that, those hopes. And I know on the ground, his comments really did impact on a lot of travellers living in Murray. Um, so that's, that's my perception of the political aspect to it. Colleagues, questions? 
have one more. Oh, do you want to come back in? Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. This is on a slightly different area. Um, we've talked a bit about access to services, particularly um, the barriers that you encounter to access to mainstream services despite paying council tax and, and the other uh, charges that um, you pay and as you would expect to benefit as everybody else does in society. I'm interested most in, um, in access to healthcare and particularly um, mental health services because particularly, for, and, and I accept there are different cultures at the table here, but for those who have a nomadic way of life, um, where perhaps it, you're not registered with a particular GP practice, um, and, and then you may also experience additional complications, particularly around mental health, given you know the, the, the barriers and significant challenges you face. Um, could you give us any, a, a flavour of, of how difficult that is and, and how you get around it? Could I? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are significant issues um, when it comes to healthcare and healthcare provision. Um, a lot of the travellers I know who live in houses have moved into houses to access healthcare. Um, and that's from sites, so that's not even been on the road. Um, on the road, it is increasingly difficult. You've got this level of scrutiny that's getting given to GP practices where they can... It's almost as if they're sort of the, an authoritarian approach on who gets registered with them. And if you're only there for a couple of days and you're shifting on to somewhere else, it's very difficult to get registered. I've had countless discussions with um, people in the NHS of all different levels, and they all clearly say to me, oh, yes, but on the road you can definitely go to this practice and there's no issues with that. There is issues. If you speak to people on the ground who are actually shifted and need to access a GP, there are issues. You can't do it. It's, it's really, really difficult. The folk make it so difficult for you, most people don't even try. In regards to mental health services, it's a, an area which, not just in Scotland, but m more activists down south as well, some of the people I work with are really taken seriously and we're doing a lot of work on it. Um, as I said in the last meeting, suicide rates amongst traveller men are increasingly high. Um, there's a variety of different reasons for that. Some say it's evictions, some say it's the work, um, basically the perpetual cycle of homelessness and unemployment. Um, so there are issues that really impact on our mental health. There's high levels of depression within the community, um, which doesn't seem to get focused on that much with mainstream charities or um, really anyone. I do a lot of work with Childline, I'm a counsellor, and I recently delivered a training to them, their counsellors, to try and better help young travellers access Childline as a resource, because up till now, there's nowhere travellers can go. If you're a young traveller and you're on the road, you've been on the road your whole life. This is an extreme example, but you've been on the road your whole life and you only know other travellers. And the only relations you have with country folk, the settled community, is the police coming and shifting you on or a council woman coming down and giving you a book. You know, it's, there's very minimal relations there. And then you start suffering from depression or you start getting suicidal thoughts. Who do you call? What do you do? There's a real, we're a missed people, we really are, when it comes to mental health services, and it's something that really does need to be tackled. I'm glad you brought it up. Can I just say you. of health that uh, your health tends to suffer when, you know, you're unable to earn an adequate income, and, you know, it's a down, downward spiral. So, for me, you know, the situation on the ground is, um, that you're not entitled to the right to work, Article 6 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and Article 7, you know, the just and favourable working conditions. You're not seeing that, so therefore people are maybe not eating well, they're not living well, um, their health suffers, then, you know, they're refused access to a local um, GP. Uh, people are not playing ball with them in terms of maybe providing them with handheld patient records in order that they can lead a mobile lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, assessments tend to be based on, you know, the, like the English model whereby you have to satisfy um, everyone in the authorities that you've travelled for over two years in order to be... Uh, you know, included in an assessment. And I wouldn't like to see that replicated in Scotland because that's the danger of being viewed as a traveller, that after two years um, you lose your status and you're no longer included in assessments for anything, housing, you know, health care, anything. But it was a valid point that I, Anthony raised there about people being <clears throat> blacklisted and... 
you know, had I known that Unite were going to be staging a protest here yesterday, I would have been outside, you know, with Rosanna, who hasn't had a day's work in 22 years on a supply list as a teacher. Despite the fact they were crying out for Gaelic teachers in my local area, um, they couldn't think of anyone suitable for the post. Now, what does that tell you about the extent of the, the racism and discrimination? But uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of points I would like to raise uh, to the committee. And <clears throat> in terms of infringements of uh, international uh, human rights, I mean, you have freedom of movement which is Article 12 in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, gypsy travellers on local authority sites in Scotland tend to be bound by the Scottish Single Secure Tenancy Agreement, which limits them to travelling off-site for um, 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks of the year. So, therefore, that's a violation of their right to freedom of movement. If they can only go off-site for 12 weeks of the year before forfeiting their tenancy on a local authority site, then, you know, that, uh, is, to me, is an impediment to them leading their cultural lifestyle. Uh, also, um, with the right to work, you've got blanket unemployment on sites that show sedentariness does not work. And, you know, there's a mobile workforce. I think this is one of the points Rosanna and other people have driven, that there is a mobile workforce at your disposal. Um, who would much rather be travelling around the country doing work on berry farms or whatever if it was there as a sustainable income. Um, also, the right to self-determination recognises the negative right of a people not to be deprived of its means of subsistence. Mm -hmm. Now, that has implications for in terms of, you know, how gypsy travellers are treated in Scotland, so there's another violation. Now, what do we intend to do about these violations? That's the question, as far as I'm concerned. Can, can I come back to the health issue? It's not, there's a fallacy that it's if you're on the road, you're not getting adequate health provision. Um, I, we've been registered with this practice for years, but the doctors change. And a few years back, after planting trees for five years, I started to feel ill and I had infection, respiratory infection after respiratory infection. I had about 18 sets of antibiotics and steroids. And I said, this can't be right. I was up the top of Dunnock and Hill planting trees with a bag on my back. How can I not walk to the shop? And I asked the GP what was wrong. He said he didn't know. And I said, well, can you not send me someone to find out? Because I don't want to be like this. And um, he said, well, who do I send you to? I said, well, send me immunology because something's gone wrong with my immune system. And he said, well, I can send you, but they won't want to see you. And I said, we'll just make the referral and we'll see about that. So he made the referral. And a few months later, I said, does anything come back? Oh, just as I said, they don't want to see you. I said, refer me um, to um, homeopathy then. Oh, I can do that, but they won't want to see you either. I said, well, do it and see. But it's secondary care and it's cost and they won't want to see you. I said, we'll just make the referral. Came back, he didn't want to see me. But I'd already phoned homeopathy and they said they were willing to see me, so I knew that was a load of rubbish. So I went in and asked to see my file and he said I wasn't allowed to see it. So when I went on holiday, I went in with a subject access request under the Data Protection Act 1998 and I got the whole lot printed out, volumes of it. Very interesting reading. Um, he'd sent a letter to the chief exec saying that I was a local traveller and quite politically active. And then I got a letter a week or so later saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do for you. So I presume that all MSPs here are not getting secondary level care because you're politically active. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Convener. Gail Ross. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know if I was um, unbelievably naive before we started this morning's session, but a lot of the evidence that I've heard has absolutely horrified me. It made me quite angry, actually, that we are still living in a society that allows things like this to happen. Um, I've only been a member of this committee since Easter. And one of the first things I did when I joined was had a, a, a private session with Mary Fee about the Gypsy Traveller community. And we had a really good session. And I know that she'd be really upset that she's not here today. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, I wanted to, to ask, um, well, 
anyone that wants to come in, but uh, David, particularly you, you spoke about um, authorised sites um, in the, the session this morning and about how a lot of your camps have been unauthorised now. And uh, you also told us a, a, in quite a lot of detail about the maintenance, the health and safety issues, the inappropriateness of the sightings. And I wondered if um, you would like to uh, go into a bit more detail, just to get some stuff on the record about sites. Yeah, um, I mean, sites. There's a, there's a huge lack of sites, as I mentioned in the last meeting. Um, a huge, huge lack. Um, the majority of people don't have anywhere to go. Um, but there's two levels to the accommodation need. Um, the first one is, of course, appropriate accommodation. Now, some travellers don't want to live on sites. They want housed. And to even access housing can be quite difficult for travellers with institutionalised racism. That's a point that's never really spoken about. Mm -hmm. But there's also the need, of course, for sites. But it's not just permanent sites. We need transit sites as well, halting sites. Because... The traditional way of life, of the, the nomadic way of life, um, and certainly a, a piece of the culture that I think most travellers enjoy, um, shifting, going on the road, is becoming increasingly more difficult. Um, our traditional camps, the majority of them have been shut down, um, whether that be through private ownership, um, taking over the land or, or development. But those pieces of, of ground, not only are they um, integral to to our culture, and we've got oral histories relating to those pieces of ground, and in, in some cases we've got, you know, um, monuments very close to them as well. I'm thinking especially about camps in Argyllshire and talking about the Tinker's Heart. Um, so there's not just the level of culture, but also it's just the more practical function of us actually staying there. The local community will develop a piece of land like that, or a local authority will, without even consulting the local community. And then they just expect us to, to know where to go after that. So if we move into that local authority not knowing that our camp's been shut, which quite often does happen, has happened to my family quite a few times, we have nowhere to go, and that's when illegal encampment happens. And then that's where you get the impact on community relations as well. Sorry, on the go Illegal encampment. Say, can I draw your attention to the guidelines for the management of unauthorised encampments? Now, this violates the right to respect for private and family life because it imposes limits on number of vehicles, breaks down the extended family unit, penalises lighting of stick fires and, you know, infringes the rights of the family to encamp as an extended family group. Um, but, you know, as Davy was saying, one of the problems is that community buyouts and the creation of national parks have eroded, um, you know, our ability to access traditional stopping places. So I would suggest that they devise a charter of traditional stopping places using uh, bioregional mapping and historical land use records so that they're safeguarded in the future. Can I come in on that one? Mm -hmm. um, a few years back when we were on the Gypsy Traveller Liaison Group for our local area, we actually agreed, a, like an, a, a, it was like an agreed stopping place. And people went there and everyone knew where they were. And most people kept it quite clean. In fact, the, the owner of a uh, Murthley Estate came out, stopped his car and said, it's so good to see you picking up litter. And um, anyway, um, this particular stop and place suddenly went by the wayside. But I noticed from looking at Traveller's Times online that uh, Leedsgate have won a, um, an award for, you know, having an agreed <coughs> stopping places. And we tried to put it on a contractual basis that if they were there for two weeks or three weeks, it was agreed with the council, it was agreed to pick up litter and all this, that would save a lot of bother. Uh, it just didn't happen because they said, oh, if we do that, then they'll have human rights. Well, I mean, we've got a Scottish National Action Plan now. Presumably, after all the money invested in it, it's going to be implemented at some point, although we don't know with Brexit. But at the end of the day, if you've got human rights, wasn't that a sensible pilot to have in a few regions? Couldn't it be a sensible pilot? And let's see if it saves 12 million in pickup costs. Because they actually knew the one family out of the eight that made the mess, they told me. But instead of putting that family out, 
and saying, right, you, we're doing you for, you know, littering up the place. They didn't do that. They didn't call the police and they didn't charge them. They put the all eight out and then a big picture appeared in the local press, going back to what you said. And it was totally distorted because it made out everyone in that lay-by did this and they didn't. There was one family out of the eight that, that made the mess. And they were, they were quite blatant about it. But then if they'd been moved on, the rest were quite tidy. And I, I just want to get the name right of the project. Was it Leedsgate? It was Leedsgate. Leedsgate. Right, okay. Can I just come in on that? Yeah, David. Um, I do a lot of work with Leedsgate. Um, I'm quite well connected in England with activists, and that's, for me, and I'm really glad you brought it up, Rosanna, a really, really good example of um, a progressive attitude. Um, and the negotiated stopping schemes, which they've got put in place, um, work brilliantly because not only do they take into account the traditional nomadic um, pathways of, of the travellers who are actually using the service, but it also shows out an element of value from the local authority towards the community, um, where they're willing to actually work in partnership with the community and um, not in a sort of an authoritarian way. Um, I'd just like to draw attention to one camp, um, just to kind of show you the, the level to which um, <coughs> the shutting down of traditional camps and the sort of constrictive nature upon our nomadic um, way of life, the impact that it's having on young people. Um, we had a camp in Kinloch Ranach and we stayed there every year since ever I can remember. I mentioned it in the last meeting. Um, the camp's now shut down because one traveller family left some mess and now it's illegal for us to stop there. Um, but we have an oral family history going right back to the massacre of Glencoe, of us staying in that one spot. And we've got countless other stories of more recent relatives staying there and all the different stuff that happened. And now it's illegal for us to stay there. Somewhere we've stayed for a very, very long time, over 320 years. So for a young traveller, it does feel like we're missing out on a bit of our culture. Um, we're missing out on the, the opportunity to actually access the, the traditional lifestyle that, that our grandparents had. Um, so from our perspective, I think the retention of traditional stopping places and nomadic camps um, by local authorities and local communities working with the travelling people is, is really, really important. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's a level that, that isn't spoken about that often, but it's one that is really important on, on the ground. Okay, thanks. David Tons. Thank you for convening and good man morning, panel. Um, can I go back to travelling sites and the lack of good quality travelling sites? Um, as somebody who has been a local councillor for a number of years before I was actually elected as an MSP, and I've seen some of the difficulties that council faces, how do we bridge a gap between the media and local communities? Because as soon as a council official <coughs> put out to consultation a site for the travelling community, I have never seen such a frenzy before whipped up by local media, and it really rallies local communities against it. So how do we actually bridge that gap and educate these local communities? Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony. Um, well, speaking from somebody who's stayed on a site, I've stayed on a site most of my life. In fact, half a mile from here, in um, Craig Miller, Durringston, just there. I stayed there for six years. To be fair with you, that there and Dalkeith site, the living conditions is a joke, to be fair with you. You know what I mean? But it's got to the way we deal with it ourselves. When I go to the warden and ask him, you know, there's an overflow of rats, you know, we stay next to rivers. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a joke, as I said, you know what I mean? It's funny to, to everybody else, you know, but we deal with it ourselves. They turn around, if I go to the warden, as I said, and tell him, you know, there's, <laughs> there's rats there. It's, it's not good. I've got baby sisters. I've got, you know, family stays around me that's young. I've got the, the, you know what I mean? Babies and things. There's rats running up and down. You turn around and you, you tell the warden, and they turn around to you and they say, oh, get a cat. <laughs> you know, that's the attitude. Do you know what I mean? It's a joke. It's, it's, it, it's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say, like, um, you know, obviously, like people's not trying for us because they are. Because uh, a couple of years ago, in in Duddingston, there was a a new guy, uh, a new warden came, and and the guy does try. You can see he tries a, mi a million times better than, you know. And you can see his attitude is, is the total opposite. He's like, you know, what I mean, obviously, I'm getting through to this, and he wants to talk to like officials, and he wants to 
make it like that, you know what I mean? I, I just reckon if there's more people not trained to deal with us, but like, you know, trained to deal with that situation, it's more of an open-minded situation. If they're, if they're trained to deal with things like that, instead of being, you know, cut off and just say, no, nah, well, it's not my problem anyway. I know everybody's got a job and, and you know, we all like to, you know, make it easier for ourselves. But like, I just reckon if, um, you know, people like that, like that's put in a position to deal with us, I reckon if, if, if the right people or if they've got like um, the right training to deal with us, you know, I, I reckon it'd be a little better. You, do you think that sense. would answer David Torrance's question as far as bridging that gap? Bridging but the breaking, gap, yeah. Breaking down some of the stereotypes, breaking down some of the, the, the clear uh, uh, um, institutional and, and direct and non-direct discrimination that goes on, yeah. some of the education that needs to go on in schools uh, for, for, for you know, people to understand the difference in, in cultures. We do this already. We do this when it comes to race. We do it when it comes to gender. We do it when it comes to sexual orientation. You know, wh wh why is there a missing link here? And that's the point. If we get that missing link right, then we, we should start to see uh, progress but that's the thing the yeah. question is how do we get rid of, how, how do we find that missing link and how do we get rid of it we're not used to you know being able to this is the first time i've ever got to talk to you know proper members of parliament and things like this here and and, and give my views out like this you know so thank you for that <laughs> no genuinely it means a lot um but we're not used to being able to come to somebody and tell their problems to we're not used to that so when it does come to it uh, somebody says there it turns into like a frenzy when the opportunity is given. Do you know what I mean? For us to say something, it does, because we're not often given that. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's the thing. And I know you want to bridge the gap, and it's, it will be hard. I reckon it's going to be a... Obviously, we've always been there. You know what I mean? I reckon it will be slow. It will be a slow thing, because nobody's perfect. Nobody can do a perfect thing fast. Do you know what I mean? Like that. I reckon it will be slow. But as long as we start moving in that direction, instead of just, you know, forget it. You know? how we do it, and I think Seamus is going to tell us, actually. <laughs> uh, several years ago, when I did a piece of research, um, it concentrated on the Special Rapporteur to the UN uh, Economic and Social Council. Now, he visited a number of uh, Eastern European uh, countries, and he noted the absence of any cultural centres. Um, that people could drop in to, to find out about the culture. Now, I'm noting a similar thing in Scotland today. You know, there are centres for every other group imaginable, but I don't see anything in terms of um, encouraging or fostering intercultural pedagogy. Um, it's a bit like the Enlightenment never happened in terms of gypsy travellers. You know, it's, you're seeing almost Goya's Capriccio, um, El Sueño de la Razón, Produce Monstros, which is the sleep of reason begets monsters. <laughs> right? Uh, and everybody's got their head buried in the sand, seeing all these bats and things. And that's what we're seeing in terms of our community, because that's never been addressed. And so the attitudes are still steeped in medieval thinking. Um, uh, you know, and Rosanna has something to say about uh, the treatment of gypsy travellers and uh, recourse to, you know, lodging something with the Press Complaints Commission. Yeah, I actually did get a successful uh, case upheld by the Broadcasting Standards Commission many years ago about a local radio station. Um, but the Press Complaints Commission, they're not covered by the, they were never covered by the Race Relations or Race Relations Amendment Act, so they were opting out and deciding how to um, self-police themselves, as it were. But the point is, it shouldn't be up to the council to tilt at windmills to, like Don Quixote, can we go down there mm -hmm. with the media? It shouldn't be up to the council because the, the um, responsibility for the press and media lies again with the state party and the central government. They've got a duty to ensure under various human rights um, instruments, um, framework convention, European convention of human rights, various ones that um, no, the press, the national press and the national media do not revile any one group. And they, they haven't been doing their job, I'm afraid. So that shouldn't be passed down to the council to do. The council's simply there to do their job as council officers and appreciate that the, the community councillors and the local councillors will put that on you. But at the end of the day, 
you're, you're hired as a council officer to do a particular job. You just go and do your job. You shouldn't have to sell something to the press or the media. That's a matter for the state party to deal with. David. Um, just going back to um, about local authorities, and I find it quite hard, like the convener of the rest of the panel, that any ethnic minority group there, there is funding, there is different people there to liaise with them, and there is very little in local authorities. And I know how hard I worked with Jess Smith to get the Tinker's Heart uh, recognised um, and to save it, actually, and how hard that was even to get that uh, through legislation to get it recognised. Do, and this is going to be difficult, does central government need to have a firmer hand on local authorities? Because then COSLA will come back to us and say, you shouldn't be interfering. <laughs> Because I had this conversation with Joanne Lamont several years ago when um, the COSLA representative was present. And, uh, you know, I stressed that she said they were autonomous. And I said, well, they get, is it around 86% of their funding from central government? So you must have some clout over them and some input in how they conduct matters. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer. You know, if they receive most of their funding from central government, then, you know, that gives you leverage to say, unless you perk up, we'll restrict your funding, your ability to access that. There is legal frameworks there as well that, that we've spoken about all the articles that, that we should be uh, using uh, in order to, to have some leverage over any organisation, whether it's a health board or a local authority. And one of the reasons why, uh, when this committee was, was reconvened after the 2016 election with a new remit, and that remit being uh, some of the new conferred powers and human rights, was why we wanted to take a, a refreshed look uh, at, at Gypsy Travellers' um, situation in Scotland, because it allowed us to come from a slightly different uh, attitude, because equalities legislation maybe re really wasn't ticking the boxes as far as, um, you know, a box ticking exercise would go uh, in that basic form. But the human rights legislation actually gives us a, a, a renewed focus and a different focus. So although we do have local authorities that will say, oh, well, you, central government should be interfering with us, and we, we've maybe got uh, central government saying, well, local authorities should be doing this. There is legal frameworks there that I think for us as a committee, we'll be looking at, at how do we ensure that those are enforced? Because I think the enforcement mechanisms are already there, they're just not getting used. And it's how do we create you know, the circumstances that these get used in the right way and for the best of intentions and to make the blinking difference, excuse me. I'll move that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think it's really important what we're speaking about and the gap um, between local authority and the community on a ground level. Um, We've seen countless times planning applications failing, um, sometimes through the fault in the application itself, sometimes not, sometimes through racism. But to me, it's common sense for a local authority. Now, local authorities are skint. I know that because, well, everyone knows that, but sitting in a meeting, the amount of moaning a local authority does, honest to God, see if you could channel that energy into tackling racism, we wouldn't be sitting here today, honestly. But... Yeah, so they, can, they complain a lot, but they, they overlook opportunities, not just to save money or to fondle, to fondle, oh Lord, to, to found relations with the community, but also to actually just be good, upstanding people. You know, you've got countless examples of traveller men and traveller women up and in the country who are willing to pump money into building their own sites. They want somewhere to live. They want somewhere they will enjoy staying. You know, they don't want to be stuck in the side of midden with the local authority saying, well, that's all you're getting, you know, you complained for accommodation we gave you. They don't want that. But they're just not being helped. In fact, they're being hindered when it comes to the planning process. And quite often, local authorities, um, from my experience, they see these, these things happening and maybe they won't help with the planning applications or they won't give support to the travellers trying to build it. But they actually go further sometimes and they actually try and impede and make it hard for travellers to actually build those sites and get those sites passed. Now, we've got John here with us today, and I'm, I'm really keen um, for John to give a perspective on this, because John's from St Cyrus, and the St Cyrus North East development, I'm sure you've all heard of in the news, um, and there's, there's quite a lot of controversy up in Aberdeenshire about it. Um, but it, to me, is a prime example of a site being built that's good for the community. Um, I'm not going to go into the planning process, but it's one of those times where the local authority just 
hasn't helped at the foundation stage. And now it's got to a level at which they're arguing with SEPA and SEPA's involved and there's, there's a lot of different things involved and it's really difficult and there's a lot of tension in Aberdeenshire and there's a lot of um, difficulty within the families as well in regards to potentially being made homeless. So if I could give John, yeah. Yep. John. It, fe it feels like they're just making up excuses really, but uh, there's over a hundred people on Narfex that's going to be put homeless maybe next month and most of them's women and children and there's nowhere really for them to go apart from a a car park or a lay-by or a football pitch even, you know, but North Esk perfect, it's kept clean, there's no bother by police or nothing, and there's even a school on there for education now, there's a school being arranged, and to be honest, it just feels like they're making up excuses, racism really, I think. Thanks, John. We are really running out of time this morning and we want to ensure that we can uh, hear as much from you as possible. We're well, well over our time already. Um, but Jamie Green, I know, wanted to come in. I think, Jamie, you'll be the final question this morning and then I'll have comments from the panel. Jamie? No problem. Thank you, convener. And uh, good morning to everyone. And thank you for your briefing uh, before the public session as well. It was very helpful. Um, I've actually got lots of questions, but in the interest of time, perhaps I can arrange for the clerks to... I uh, have a further conversation with um, some of the panel outside of the realms of the committee, which I know doesn't put on the record, but I would find very helpful. Uh, lots of very specific questions that I think would be helpful for me to understand. So I'll take it more wide in this respect. I mean, we've been talking about this issue really since the uh, opening of this parliament. I've been looking at the track record. I'm quite new to this parliament and quite new to this committee. So I've gone back through the, the timeline of events and, and all the various things that have happened, the inquiry in 2001, a review of the inquiry in 2005, which was quite critical, I, I note. A working group in 2006, a round table in 2009. I think you see where I'm going with this question. Um, I'm feeling a bit of deja vu in that respect. And whilst I'm extremely hopeful that the makeup of this committee will make some very positive steps and moves forward, how do you feel about it? I, I mean, as, as the, the Anthony Johnson said, we're just a small handful of people in a country of many millions, and whilst we're politicians, realistically, what can this committee achieve so that we're not looking back in 17 years having exactly the same conversation? Attempt to tackle the populist view that, you know, we are a bunch of parasites who subsist on the thrifting industry of others, and the way in which they can do that is by embracing the European Commission's recommendation that there should be activation in terms of employment so that the society general, you know, wider society can see our usefulness. Now, we've been a resource to the Scottish economy for centuries in the past, and then all of a sudden we're binned. You know, um, we're frozen out of the employment arena. It's almost like looking at Hungary, where there's almost 100% unemployment in Roma who have been placed in ghettos and sedentarised. So, you know, I think you need to try to uh, steer the, the uh, treatment of gypsy travellers, you know, down a different route and encourage, um, you know, nomadism again. Could I come in with that? Um, yeah, I think what Seamus is saying about employment is really important. Um, but there's also a level where a lot of travellers, certainly in my family, um, they'll do work like landscaping work or roofing or mobile trades trades that you can take with you if you shift or if you want to up sticks and go to another part of the country. Um, and quite often, as Anthony said in the last meeting, um, these trades are taught by fathers to their sons and it gets passed down like that. There's never really a stage at which a traveller bairn would think of going to college or to go to a different apprenticeship, but they would usually learn from their dad. And with that, there, it's, it's, it's a trade which is learned and, and the traveller band would, would usually use that going up through life. But there's so many issues with it in that a lot of people, um, a lot of traveller folk who, who learn those trades, they might learn mistakes from their dads. So sometimes you get shoddy workmanship and you do. And some travellers do, um, like every community. There's shoddy workmen in the settled community as well. Um, but for whatever reason, we get tarred with the brush of maybe that one shoddy person. However, it's important to also realise that that person might not be doing it on purpose, but they might have learned that mistake. We're missing the educational bit. And to me, education's a really big factor in this. 
um, not just culturally appropriate education. I know Aberdeenshire is doing some great work just now in regards to um, learning packs, and I know Steps done some good work in the past. Um, it's not just the mobile education that Burns can take with them if they're shifted, but it's also accessing education and accessing education that will actually work. Teachers don't have the first clue about the culture. And I've heard from countless people that there's been work done with teachers and that, that schools and education are, are kind of up to date on resources to train their teachers. It's not getting used. It really isn't. Teachers are completely in the dark when it comes to the traveller community and it's really impacting on the bounds. They just, they just don't know. Like, my girlfriend's mum is a teacher, and they had some traveller bands come to the school. And at least she had the, the ability to actually sit down with me and say, right, so how does the culture work, and how does this work, and how does that work, before actually teaching the bands? There isn't that level that n normal teachers who don't have a connection to the community have, and I feel like they're being left in the dark, and it's impacting upon the bands. And I've heard some horrendous stuff from teachers. I really have. At the end of the day, they're just people. Politicians, they're just people. It doesn't matter what level you get to. You don't get more interest in inequality. You don't get more nice the higher up you go. We've seen that with Douglas Ross. But there's a level where we're all people, and it needs to be treated as a society in regards to teaching the culture. But I'd just like to share a couple of the things that teachers have said um, to me. Um, when I was younger, I went to school, and I'd just lived on a camp for, for a long time, and it was the first school I'd been to in, in a wee while. And um, I get my, my homework kept getting missed, basically. And month after month, it just kept getting missed. Mum said, right, there's something wrong here. You know what I mean? She thought it was me no day in it, but it was. So she, uh, she's cracking to her friend about it. And uh, the friend says, go crack to the teacher about it. So she does. She went and told the teacher, look, what's happening with son's work? Oh, I must have missed it for the last whatever. And uh, mum's cracking to her friend two weeks later. And uh, the friend says... Ken, I heard something really horrible at the school gate yesterday. And uh, mother said, I, what, what was it? And she said, well, the teacher came out and uh, she was talking about me, the teacher, to another mother. And she said, um, why would I waste school resources on him? I know he's a gypsy and he won't do anything with it anyway. And that attitude really is fully alive amongst teachers. Another teacher at high school... Um, I, I wasn't out as a traveller at high school. We had to keep that quiet for discrimination. My dad getting work, which is another issue which people don't focus on that much, is hidden travellers at school. Um, but this teacher anyway was sitting and we had a camp roll up and uh, they were there and the teacher turned around and they said, so class, did you see the pikeys have moved in? To a whole class. So there's a level where teachers are teaching it to the bands. I've done surveys with first year pupils, some 11 years of age, and some of the things they said, I recorded one saying, they're all scum in regards to travellers, get rid of them, and they're given too much respect. Why do we need them as a society? Now, to me, I presented that, the whole write-up of that report and all of that data, as well as some other horrendous stuff, to the head teacher, as well as to the local authority. Nothing has happened with that report. Nothing. In fact, it's been shelved. To me, if those comments were directed towards any other ethnic minority group, there would be an absolute outroar. And there's certainly not the, the platform for young travellers to access education right now. I wouldn't be confident um, saying to my younger sisters or saying to my cousins who had perhaps been on a camp their whole life, you know, go to school. You know what I mean? Because there's not the level of actual respect there. It doesn't exist. And the experience that they would have would be so detrimental to them, I would actually say, well, to be honest, don't bother. We need transitional programs as well, as another thing. We need transitional programs, not just for kids who might be going from primary to secondary as travellers, but also travellers who have maybe just came from a camp and never been to school before, and they're maybe 16. It doesn't exist. The, the, the environment of a camp or a site is very, very different to that of a school. And quite a lot of the exclusions we've seen with young travellers is because they don't understand that difference. They're getting punished for something they don't even understand they're getting punished for because they don't understand how a school system works because it's so different. And there's such a lack of knowledge around the culture. So I think it is a real issue and I think education needs to be looked at again. 
I think we, Rosanna, Rosanna, really quickly. Answer that yeah, question. Yeah, I think you need some role models because let's look at Scottish Parliament. How many gypsy travellers have you got? How many have you got employed? How many is on the Quality Human Rights Commission? How many are employed? How many is in the Scottish Human Rights Commission? How many are employed? Let's go through it all. Statistics, the BBC, how many are employed? And it comes back to what folk are saying about employment because all the non-gypsy traveller friends I have, and they're, they're good friends, um, they used to come and see me in my car, and I met them through work. So if people are not working, they're isolated because they don't have the money to socialise. So therefore, work has to be a key priority. And it's better to get people... I used to work with an ancillary service with the job centre too because they couldn't get me a job, so they put me in to teach all the people that couldn't read and write. And... Um, the ancillary service, what I noticed, it's far better for those people, even gy the gypsy travellers came in, they wanted a job. They didn't want to sit and do bits of paper. They wanted to do something. So it's much better to place people in apprenticeships and, and mo mentor them throughout and get them into the workforce. And far better for them to be working than claiming benefits because if they're dependent on welfare state and social security for the rest of their life, um, they're never going to prosper and they're never going to have, um, you know, good self-esteem, good health, etc. So the whole lot is going to save money, not only in benefits, not only in support services, but also in health services. Because while I was working planting trees, my diabetes was under control. No tablets. Yeah, I think we've, we've, we've drastically run out, ran out of time this morning. Um, Obviously, uh, it looks like the work of this committee is not done on this at all. Um, Jamie, I know that you had said that you would uh, have a private briefing. Um, if there's any specific questions from that, I would be really grateful if you could share that with the committee, because any learning that we can do, either as individuals or as a committee, helps us in our deliberations and our recommendations to, to government. We're not finished with this issue. I think. Given the committee's renewed focus on human rights, it gives us a different angle to look at this from, with, with absolutely clear frameworks in there. Putting that aside with the frameworks, because we know where that is, there's a whole host of issues in there, education and health and sites and planning and all of that that's still never been resolved. And some of the clear uh, institutional racism that's going on there, that's certainly of interest to this committee. So if you go away and you think, I should have said this, or I should have told them that, please write to us and let us know. We will be really grateful to have that, that information. Uh, we will probably speak to you again, because as I say, this issue is not finished for us by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, next week, the Scottish Government have a debate on the race equality framework, and I've been reassured that there's a whole um, section in that on gypsy travellers um, in a response to some of the work that's been done over the years. Uh, there'll be a, a debate on that next week, and I think it's the, the report's the, the strategy is being launched in the morning, uh, as far as I know. And there's a debate. No doubt many of us will take part in that next week. So if you've got specific points that you think that we should be raising in the chamber on your behalf, then I'm sure as committee members we would be happy to, to do that too. Um, but we're very grateful for your evidence this morning. Thank you so much for, for coming along. I know some of them, some of you didn't have your say, but I think you've got lots to say. And if you've got a way to see it in a different way instead of being com coming to committee then um, we're, we'll be uh, pleased to hear that too um, but thank you so much and best of luck with everything that you're doing and best of luck with, with everything that you, you guys are doing as well because it really helps um, and uh, I'm going to end committee at that point and I think I'm going into private, private session. session so uh, we're going to suspend it going to private session a quick comfort break and back in your seats please <laughs>